Uh, Janet, thank you, Cynthia, for being here today. So I'm in, I'm, today I'm in an academic mode. So um, I'm going to actually, I made some slides with assistance of um, Hannah Aram, who's in charge of uh, COVID-19 response at the hospital and at the GW. So there, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. But there are just a few slides. They're really more of a uh, updates. Uh, I don't have a specific topics be, beyond the um, slides, so I think I'd rather concentrate today on the questions, which I'm sure there are plenty of. So as I mentioned, just a courtesy uh, uh, to Hannah Axelrod for sharing the slides. So this is the couple of days ago. This is not most up to date. I think this is three days ago. So we across 250,000 deaths, uh, cases are approaching 12 million. What's really most concerning is that we have a pretty rapid increase in uh, daily cases. So we are standing up, uh, you know, up to 70% increase over last, since last week. Uh, and the death seems to be also climbing. And unfortunately, of course, you all were aware that deaths are uh, delayed by two to four weeks due to the nature of the illness. What you're seeing in the large picture in a color, uh, the deeper the red, the more cases per uh, 100,000. So you can see that some of the states specifically in the kind of Midwest are pretty heavily hit, um, you know, with the pockets of a very high um, rate of infectivity pretty much everywhere in the whole country. Uh, the lower left, uh, it's our uh, changes in the last couple of weeks in our own area. So you see that every tri-state area is seeing a spiking, Virginia a little bit less, but both Maryland and district seeing about 30% rise. Um, and from what you see that Maryland rate of infections now way surpassed the peak in spring. DC is about to do the same unless trajectory changes in the upcoming weeks. Okay. Um, how about you hold the questions until I'm done with the brief talk because it's hard for me to see the chat at the same time. All right, so next, next slide is, um, so some updates, um, lower cost home labs are here. There are two specific labs I wanna highlight. This uh, company, Lucera, just announced that they got FDA approved uh, two days ago and they're gonna come out with a $50 a home test that will be done within 30 minutes and they should be selling starting to sell this in florida and i forgot the other state as early as next month <coughs> and then they hope that for the rest of the country the kits will be available early next year this is an antibody test you basically take a, your own swab you put it in a little uh, um, collection container whirl it around and then wait for 30 minutes and the result comes onto your smartphone. And uh, the LabCorp, this is most exciting actually. So the LabCorp just announced two weeks ago that they're going to start doing home kit that it will be an insurance based. Now the difference between these two kits, this is the antibody test. So it's accuracy, even though the company, the Lucera claim 97% accuracy, I would question that. This is probably a controlled setting accuracy. I think the real life ac accuracy will be closer to 80, 85%, but it's still pretty good. And the, the, the one thing I would be cautioning anybody in doing this type of testing when you don't have symptoms or when your symptoms are very mild, the reality is that the antibody tests are quite inaccurate if there is not a lot of symptoms. The more symptomatic a person is, the more likely the accuracy goes up. In contrast, PCR is extremely sensitive, so it's much more accurate, but it can actually have false positive in contrast to the Lucera test, which is if the test is positive, it's extremely likely that it's a true result versus in, term, in case of the PCR test, you could have false positive. But this test is gonna be covered by every existing insurance. There is gonna be a, a, a about $20 copay, we'd starting this test at our own clinic next week. So patients, anybody who is uh, within our clinic will be able to call us and for whatever the reason, order the test. We will not be um, screening patients. We believe that we're all adults who are ordering the kit. If you decide to order, it means there is a reason. And um, 
with that, it'll be $25 charge and the uh, LabCorp claimed to us, we talked to their leadership last week, they're claiming that they are not expecting any denials for any reasons. Um, they are also got support from the federal government to cover uh, situations where insurance refuses to pay. So with that, uh, I think this is going to be my preferential test, mostly because um, they are, have told us that they will turn the result within 24 hours. Now, I, I you know, that's LabCorp saying that. We will, I'll report on this sometime after Thanksgiving once we run a couple of tests and we know what the real turnaround time actually is. It's this very similar collection method. You do your own nasal swab, but then you put it in a tube and you mail it back and it's back and forth via FedEx. So the lab sends your kit to your home and then you collect the sample, you send it back. Uh, but the order has to be done through the physician office. I'm assuming that a lot of the physician office is gonna start offering this very quickly. We just signed up yesterday for this. So they'll approve us on Monday. And then as early as Tuesday, we should be able to start recommending the tests. Okay, so that's the testing. And then of course the vaccines. So vaccines is a probably biggest update. <laughs> Um, now, both Pfizer and Moderna, those are the two mRNA vaccines. I on purpose decided that this is a great slide because it compares side by side all the data we have on these two vaccines. You can see that the Moderna had a smaller number of volunteers, um, in, in, uh, but very large number of sites over, across the country and, and internationally. You can also see that in Pfizer, they had a much higher rates of infectivity. I don't necessarily think it's important. It's just how, I guess, the, the areas where they selected the patients from had higher infect, infection rate. So you can see that the, that's how they calculated their efficacy. So in Pfizer, 162 patients in placebo versus eight in vaccine got sick. And then in the Moderna, it's 90 over five. Um, and then not, 10 cases of severe COVID in Pfizer, of which nine uh, were in placebo and 11 cases in um, Moderna. Now you need to think about something here. So we have been told that the mortality in the beginning of the epidemic was somewhere around two to 3%, depending on where you are in the States. If you carefully think about this now in terms of there's, there's almost no mortality here and a severe illness percent, that's 10 patients in tens of thousands of cases. So it's a very low chance of severe illness. Now, is this because the disease changed? Is this because um, you know we know more and we're preventing and we're doing the social distancing better? Probably altogether all those factors, but that's important to pay attention to just general behavior of the illness itself. Now, of course, you could also ask a very reasonable question. Wait a second. So that's a very low number of people who are getting sick out of everybody. Well, that's true, but that's in a very short period of time. So what happens after another three to six months? Is this 90 going to be 9,000? We just don't know. So, you know, the reality is uh, this, all this data is only some data for the few weeks, not even months. So, of course, the second big question is, how long is the immunity going to last? Again, nobody knows. Um, when the same slide was discussed by Dr. Aram, uh, sorry, Dr. Axelrod in Grand Rounds yesterday, she pointed out the fact that she and many other expert infectious disease doctors expecting that the vaccine will not last for more than three to six months. So that means <clears throat> we're all going to have to get boosters periodically. But if the booster is this efficacious and relatively safe, uh, most people probably would be in agreement that it, it, worth it. it is worth it. So, oh, sorry, in terms of the chances of side effects, you can see the what the company is reporting. Um, again, it's probably too early to say, are there any further out side effects? But, you know, their side effects were there. They were relatively infrequent. We have to get more data to assess this more carefully. Now, the advantage of Moderna, main advantage is that it can be 
transported on the standard cold chain uh, temperatures, what that means is just the refriger standard refrigeration versus the Pfizer vaccine must be refrigerated minus degrees Celsius. That's the uh, temperature either of a uh, liquid nitrogen or um, dry ice. So that's a very specific uh, and much harder to do. However, this was done in case of Ebola vaccine. We do know that it's doable. We do know that it costs more, but it's, it's, but it can be done and it's, it's been done before. So there's a positive precedent, okay? So let's move, how am I doing on time? I'm a little behind, okay. So, um, so antibody news, I think this is sort of important. So the neutralizing antibody, you know, again, it's been back and forth, but this is now a very large study basically saying in essence, there's just not enough data to recommend uh, neutralizing antibody for anybody for any reason, and it should not be considered a standard of care. Now, this is, we're talking about the New England Journal of Medicine. So I, I, I take this for myself as I'm putting this whole conversation of a, a Regeneron uh, drug that was given to, the, to uh, our President Trump and similar uh, uh, away from currently. I, I'm shel shelving it because I don't think there's enough data to say that it's doing anything. Okay. And the last but not least is our own local updates. So we are, um, there's some really interesting data coming from our own hospital saying that unfortunately higher dose anticoagulation doesn't seem to work. Uh, remember earlier on a couple of months ago, we've discussed that this virus tend to cause clots, blood clots. And there was a thought that giving a anticoagulation to everybody when the patient gets admitted to a hospital is worth it. Turned out that it's probably not worth to give a high dose, but it's probably worth to give a low dose. It's a good news. It means that giving a low dose heparin uh, or even maybe high dose aspirin is probably sufficient. Now, should that does that mean everybody should start taking aspirin? Absolutely not. Uh, you can achieve anticoagulation very quickly early in the onset of illness. So talk to your doctor, but absolutely do not start any blood thinners because there's absolutely no need to do so. And then we are starting medical faculty associates starting a COVID recovery clinic. It's going to be led by Dr. Axelrod, uh, as well as Dr. Chen and Dr. Lipson. <coughs> Sorry. And, um, oh, by the way, uh, last Friday, I did get really violently sick that night after I said, I told to everybody, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And uh, I had a pretty a moderate great fever uh, late at night by saturday i just you know i decided i'm going fishing no matter what last day of fishing i'm going so i went fishing i was okay for a couple hours and i got tired again a little febrile again so i actually ended up going and getting tested because i was like oh maybe i have a covid so of course i didn't have any covid but i'm still coughing a little bit so bottom line common colds common illnesses they're still just as much around so fyi um but are we excited about the recovery clinic and, and we're going to see if the GWCIM and our Office of Integrated Medicine can also work uh, with the recovery clinic. We're, we have some potential research projects already in workings and in discovery phase. And with that, I'm going to stop in 2.15. <coughs> Pretty good. And I'm going to stop sharing the slides and open up for questions. Okay. Uh, and the outbreak coincide with some two weeks after the election and demonstrations before, during. Do you think this is an actual correlation? No, no, outbreak started way before. And uh, I, we, you know, it, it's not really clear if um, whatever happened around an uh, election with the demonstrations, whether they impacted this, and they probably have to some degree, but the spikes have started occurring before that. It was predicted, it was very anticipated, mostly due to the fact that it's a cold, temp cold temperatures now and there's more indoor gathering. Plus on top of that, um, you know, we think that uh, generally speaking, virus is a lot more resistant to cold temperatures than to hot temperatures. So virus can survive on the surfaces a lot longer and can probably be more infectious during this time. Okay, was there 
Some other tests of longer term memory cells that seem to indicate longer immunity after COVID. Um, so from what I read, it's a great question. So from what I read a couple of days ago, they're trying to figure out uh, how to create an assays on assessing the length of immunity. The problem is the antibody seems to quickly win off, win themselves down and become undetectable in almost all mildly ill patients after about three months. Now, but that doesn't mean that the immunity is gone. We just don't know. It's possible that immunity is still there, but it's a critical question. If the antibody is not the main memory uh, signature, what is? I don't know if anybody knows what is. There has been suspicious suspicion that some of the T cells can carry some memory effects, memory characteristics. But I, am, I don't think I have an answer for that. Um, but it's a really good question. So I'm gonna try to see if I can answer it in upcoming weeks. And by the way, I know um, Jane wanted to have an update on the treatment. The reason I'm not really doing the update on treatment because we have a lot more important things I feel to discuss. So eventually I'll give an update when we have a little slower week where I'll say sort of what is the current standard on inpatient side. For the outpatient for recovery, there is no standards and nobody knows exactly what to do. So it's all getting formulated and, and sort of moving in as we speak. Uh, but for the inpatient, there are quite clear specialized protocols. And I think that it, at some point I'll, I'll cover that because I understand it's interesting for a lot of people. Okay, Linda's asking, isn't important data on tracking COVID and hospitalization being withheld from public? Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that at this point, uh, CDC is withholding any data. I don't want to be a conspiracist and I don't think that this is happening. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, if anybody have a different opinion, I guess we can talk about it. If the data is withheld, it's probably important, but I doubt that it is. How is it possible to get a cold or flu given the precautions we already? Well, a uh, great question. I mean, look, uh, people are increasing mask use, or so we hope, right? But we're still getting infected. Masks are, are good. Uh, they're not perfect. They, uh, in the studies that I'm currently reviewing, uh, they seem to have quite significant efficacy, but it's not anywhere near 100%. It's not even 50%. I mean, you're looking 20 to 30% decreased risk of infection, but that's the best we have, right? So uh, you're, you're never going to cut infection rate to zero unless you literally just take off, move yourself into a cabin in the middle of the forest and anybody coming close by, you shut the warning shot into the air. You know, the reality is it's an impractical, right? We're not going to do that. Nobody will, and and you know we're going to live our life, and we we have to figure out the best possible package. You know, it's going to be a package: a vaccine, masks. You know, maybe they're going to be all this new upcoming tools, like I have been reviewing this new products of a UV light, the sterilizing uh, lamps inserted at the different target areas in different buildings. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of technology also boosting all these benefits. Meantime, we have to do what we have to do. And, and um, basically, <coughs> Suzanne, you just brought the most important question. How do we optimize this any further? We need a national voice. We need a clear cut evidence-based recommendations that everybody can follow. And so that I will stop arguing on my Facebook with my uh, colleagues who don't believe in masking and other things because the problem is there's a lot of division and we talked about this before. So let's move on. Um, just 21, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, is the PCR test at GW regardless of symptoms? So uh, it's a great question. Um, we will offer the PCR test to anybody for whatever the reason. We just expect that you're adult and you're not gonna simply order the test just because you just decided to order the test because you woke up from and stood on a left leg. There, there's a, some reason. The problem is um, there's two issues. So one, um, it's screening every patient for every symptom is gonna be uh, increasingly logistically difficult. 
Uh, everybody knows what the symptoms are. If they really want to get tested, they'll lie about it. So I feel like, again, be an adult and order the test when you want to order it. And I also feel strongly that we need to cut the barriers to care to the minimum, mostly because the problem currently, you know, we have, let me give you, so what I had to do on sad, Sunday night, because I was seeing patients Monday, Tuesday, I needed to get a negative result. Otherwise I would have not went to work, even though by Sunday I felt <coughs> completely to normal, just a little bit of this bronchitis clearing cough, which I'm pretty sure is not infectious anymore. So, you know, I checked in, I, I looked up our own institution, we don't offer rapid tests. So what am I to do if I were to get the lab core test? I'd have to wait till two days. That's too late. So I checked in at MedStar, thanks to Nancy, who's here, who told me, look, go to MedStar. They do a 20 minute test and they do. So the reality is the more different tests we have, the more availability we have, it's simply going to get not only more data quickly, but it's also going to give us some sense of control and, 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 and safety and, and understanding that we can navigate this. I think the most disheartening issue for me early on was every sneeze a patient had, we couldn't figure out, you know, like there was just this fear built in, is this it, right? So now with all these tests, we can live the life. And when something starts happening, you know what you should be doing. And I think that's that's in itself, I think is going to be critical because it's going to lower our anxiety and we'll start getting <coughs> adjusted to living the life with the virus. Okay, is the recovery clinic at GW inferior for long-term COVID patients? Well, so there is no such thing as long-term COVID patients, right? We call those patients, I hate that word, long haulers. It's like, I think it's a trackers that called long haul trackers, right? Like it's just a crazy bad name, but so recovery word is much better. Um, so the point is that there are a lot of patients up to 50% of everybody who had mild uh, to moderate disease and to severe rec don't fully recover. So they have residual symptoms even though months after. And so there is a clear need to establish some kind of a treatment system to support patients like this. I actually feel strongly that the standard of care is gonna have very little to offer. I, I feel like this is where integrative medicine is going to shine. I feel strongly that um, to our luck, the clinic is gonna be led by a, a person, by Dr. Uh, Axelrod, who's quite um, supportive of our work. She was one of the key she was one of the co-PIs on the intravenous vitamin C study that we submitted to BART. Unfortunately, we didn't get it funded, but nonetheless, she was very interested in the project. So we think that we'll be able to leverage some of the local um, political climate towards our benefits. We think that we're going to apply for some grants to try to fund some of the research, but also just to see if we can see patients at the lower cost. So I'll just leave it at that for now, just because I want to run through, finish through the questions and... Preliminary result, uh, are any preliminary results yet from the pilot transdermal? I don't have any update. I think we'll have to ask Dr. Uh, Hyman. I'll, uh, I'll check in with him. Alyssa, thanks so much for reminding about that. What vaccine is GW? Okay, so uh, GW is using AstraZeneca. So it's none of the, the two that we discussed. I on purpose left that one out because it is... Uh, runner up, but they don't have their data yet reported. You probably all heard that there was some complication in England with their vaccine. So the trial was on hold for some period of time until they figured out that's actually very common. So the trial was restarted when they realized the problem wasn't trial related. Okay. Um, does the fact that your study has so many different age control makes it stand out? In it? Um, right. So again, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is very different. It's a DNA vaccine versus RNA vaccine. So comparing those two is going to be a little tricky and challenging. Um, you know, those are older vaccines. They tend to be, um, well, we think that it's not going to be just as effective. The RNA vaccines are known from the past, uh, just a few instances, Ebola is main one, that they've been very effective. The problem before, they were thought to be impractical because of the freezing issue that they had to be frozen so so deeply uh, but again can that get overridden and can we move it forward um, well hopefully we can I mean that's what the Pfizer is really saying to the public um, okay I think with that I am right on time and um, it gives me a pleasure to Cynthia was already here with us Cynthia is a somebody I work 
well, not as closely as with Janet, but almost as closely. Uh, Cynthia is in charge of the Office of Student Opportunities at GW and in her role, she and I work closely to help our track students, in my case, integrated medicine track students, um, to help them through their four year of medical school. So, and Cynthia has been interested in mindfulness and has been teaching mindfulness for our students, faculty and greater GW community for a number of years. So it's just wonderful to have her here and do a practice with her. Thank you, Dr. Kogan. And I, good, hello everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today. So for those of you who may be new to meditation and mindfulness, and for those of you who may like a refresher, Meditation, according to National Institute of Health, is a mind and body practice that has a long history of use for increasing calmness and physical relaxation, improving psychological balance, coping with illness, as well as enhancing overall health and well being. And mind and body practices focus on the interactions of the mind, body, and behavior with the intent to use the mind to affect physical functioning and promote health. Mindfulness, as defined by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who is the founder of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at University of Massachusetts Medical School. His view of mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Another way of viewing this is paying attention to our thoughts, our feelings, our bodily sensations, as well as the environment around us with curiosity, compassion, and non-harmful judgment. And research on mindfulness has identified several benefits, including reduction in stress, enhanced focus, less emotional reactivity, more cognitive flexibility, an increase in relationship satisfaction, as well as increased immune functioning. And there are various ways to practice mindfulness, including but not limited to meditation, and bringing attention to our daily activities. So the first practice I'd like to share with you is focused on the five senses. And the goal of this practice includes helping to calm the mind by using the senses and focusing on the environment to bring us into the present moment. So as we begin, I invite you to take a few moments to find a comfortable position. And in meditation, this can be sitting, standing, or lying down. So being in a relaxed position, yet still alert. And take a few moments to tune into your body, taking a few deep, relaxing breaths. And the mind, body, and breath are intimately connected and can influence each other. So the first step in this practice, I invite you to take a moment to notice five things that you can see. So glancing around your current environment and perhaps challenging yourself to pick one or more items that you may not usually notice perhaps light reflecting on a surface or a unique pattern on a wall. Just paying careful attention to your surroundings. The second step in this practice is noticing four things that you can feel, bringing attention to what you're feeling, such as the texture of your clothing or the pressure of your feet on the floor, hot, cold, sharp, soft. There are many textures to experience.
for the third step. Notice three things that you can hear in this moment. Listening for what you notice in the background. It could be the sounds of nature or perhaps an appliance in another room. Being mindful of any sounds that come your way. Letting them come and go. The fourth step is noticing two things that you can smell. Bringing attention to scents that you may usually filter out, you know, either pleasant or unpleasant. Perhaps a smell of plants or flowers, or food or coffee in the kitchen. Mindfully breathing in the scents around you. And finally, notice one thing that you can taste. Perhaps take a sip of a drink, eat a snack if you have one, or perhaps the lingering flavor of toothpaste or your last meal. And instead of judging the taste as good or bad, simply notice how your taste buds respond. And as we come to the end of this particular practice, it's a way to help us feel more centered. A senses practice only takes a few minutes and may bring our awareness to our senses, hopefully in a calming and soothing way. The second practice I'd like to share with you is a breath and sound meditation. It's gonna be a little bit of a longer practice and again, I invite you to be in a comfortable position. This could be in the same position you're currently in, or you may wanna to shift to either sitting, standing, or lying down. Again, in a relaxed yet alert posture. And once you're in your preferred position, I invite you to take three deep, breaths. I also want to invite you to gently close your eyes or lower your gaze if you feel more comfortable. And as we start this practice, take a moment to notice your body, feeling the points of contact with the chair or the floor, and let yourself relax. intentionally relaxing any areas of tightness or tension. And 
and taking a few moments to tune into the breath in your body. Just feeling a natural flow of breath. Our breathing is influenced by our thoughts and our thoughts and physiology can be influenced by our breath. And taking a moment to notice where you feel the breath in your body. It may be in your nostrils, throat, chest, or abdomen. See if you can feel the sensations of breath, one breath at a time and one moment at a time. And noticing the pause as one breath ends and the next breath begins. It may be helpful to say to yourself silently, breathing in as you inhale and breathing out as you exhale. And during this practice, you might notice that your mind starts to wander. And if so, this is very natural. Just take a moment to notice that your mind has wandered and then gently bring your focus back to the present moment.
And now I invite you to let your awareness shift from your breath to sound. Turning your attention to sounds all around you. Hearing them as they arise and noticing when they are no longer present. listening to the sounds close by in the room around you and any subtle sounds in the distance. Notice how sounds appear and disappear. They simply arise and pass by. And I invite you to remain open to whatever sounds arise. No need to name the sounds. Simply hearing them as they are. And if you don't hear anything in this moment, that is okay. Perhaps tune into the silence that surrounds you. And see if you can be very kind and compassionate to yourself in this process. Perhaps placing a hand or both hands on your chest over your heart. Noticing the soothing touch. And I now invite you to relax your attention from a the sounds around you. And take a few moments to notice how you feel. Through mindfulness, we're able to tune into our senses and experience the present with greater awareness and acceptance.
And I encourage you to offer yourself some appreciation for doing this practice today. Taking time to focus on your self care and well being. And as we start to bring this practice to a close, you may want to bring some gentle movement to your body. Perhaps wiggling your fingers and toes. And gently moving your head from side to side. And when you're ready, gently opening your eyes. Thank you, Cynthia. This was wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. So if anyone else still have questions to me, to Cynthia, maybe any reflections on the practice? Anybody would like to say a word or two? I find that sometimes during the day, it actually helps to lay down to do this practice. Um, I find that it just it's easier to relax and go deeper into the body. Okay, so there's there's a number of people who are thanking you in the chat. Well, with that, uh, there's no more questions. I think everybody's so mellowed out. That's perfectly fine. We'll end a couple of minutes early. Um, I believe next week we are skipping due to Thanksgiving. So we will see you all on... Um, November 4th. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> to relax, to keep numbers in the head. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye. The same to you. Bye. Thank you. I'll stay here for a couple of minutes in case anybody have any last minute questions. Thank, thank you, you Cynthia. Thank you all and thank you for being a community. Thank you, Cynthia. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. You're welcome, Dr. Jane. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I really like this weekly times because I don't take time out to do meditation. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, how about you practice this daily until next time? I'm, try I'm trying, but <laughs> I always get distracted, but I'm going to try. Thank you for reminding me. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. Question above. Uh, Sherry, I don't see your question above. And I'm looking at all the questions. If you have a question that Dr. Um, Kogan has not answered, please unmute yourself and just ask it. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if Cynthia Powell led the meditation session on imagining oneself as a boulder uh, in the ocean. Was that you, Cynthia? I have a feeling Cynthia really, oh, she's still here. Okay, good. Uh, not that particular visual, but it sounds quite peaceful. <laughs> okay. Thanks. 
I have a question. Go, Caroline. Yeah. Um, do you know once the vaccine is is ready for dissemination, what's the hierarchy for getting it? I know the healthcare workers and yeah, and it's they all get the vaccine first. Do you know the hierarchy next? Yeah. So the next would be the high. So there would be a um, breakdowns of the risks so what it means is that they're going to vaccinate first the people at the highest risk uh, those would be the people over 65 with multiple comorbidities um, i don't actually i have not seen the finalized documents as okay, to sort of okay. how they're going to see the brackets but it's going to be from the highest risk down and then eventually i think there's three or four categories after first responders and the, what's called a high priority Right. Um, uh, population so then there's going to be like a secondary th second third and fourth waves after um, you know you can imagine the, the complexity of the task because we're talking about tens of millions of people in each category yeah. and so mm -hmm. or, or more uh, and 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 currently we don't even have enough vaccine pledged for production we only have i believe somewhere close to 150 million doses which is because remember, this is <coughs> two doses for each vaccine. So, right. you know, we don't have a doses enough for even a third of population as we speak. Um, I mean, they're going to rev this up eventually, but it, it's a pr production of this many doses of a brand new vaccine that wasn't made before is not an easy task. Okay, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Very good questions today. And they're always good, but today we're especially must be a Cynthia's presence grounds people. They don't ask they don't ask questions that uh, out there and don't have good answers.